We have previously seen how to write an expression for a truth table and then how to simplify that expression. Now we will look into Carnot maps, which are a visual means to discover where there are simplifications. When we looked at simplification before, we saw that there were two main tricks, if you will, that led to simplification. So we started with a sum of product approach, min terms, and then if two terms in that expression differed by one and only one input, that led to a simplification. And then a given term may participate in multiple simplifications. But these are not easy to find in a large uh, Boolean expression. So we're going to introduce a method called the Carnot map to make this simplification visual. And the first step in that is going to be to rearrange the inputs in what's called gray code order. Here, gray is not a color, gray is a person. So gray is Frank Gray, a researcher from Bell Labs. Here's a picture of Frank Gray investigating an early version of television. Remember that we made a truth table. We needed on the input side all the possible combinations of zeros and ones. Their order didn't matter so long as we accounted for all the possible combinations. Since we were already familiar with binary counting, binary numbers and binary counting, we used the counting order to make sure that we had all of the combinations of ones and zeros. But any combination would do. Gray introduced a, a different ordering of the numbers which have properties that are different from binary counting and will be useful to us here. The main feature of gray code, the, the ordering of the numbers introduced by gray, is that the consecutive numbers in this order differ by one and only one bit. So we see here an example of a three input gray code order. So let's think about the numbers as binary numbers and sort of go down the list and see what binary numbers they are. So starting from the top, we see 0, 1, 3, 2, 6, 7, 5, and 4. So all the, all the numbers are there, all the combinations are there, but they're clearly not in our counting order. But the important property of this ordering from gray is that in from one row to the next, only one bit changes. So in this top row, 0, 0, 0, going to the next row, 0, 0, 1, only one bit changed. Uh, going from the second to the third row, only the middle bit changed. Going from the third to the fourth row, only the last bit changed. Only one bit changes as you go proceed from row to row. This is the identifying property of gray code. One can construct gray code by working with a reflection operation. So let's start in the right column here with just a simple zero and one. So we started originally in the right hand column with just that zero and one at the top, and then we will reflect them. And so the zero then one reflected becomes one zero. You imagine a mirror and the, the one was closest to the mirror in the original. So in the reflection, the one is also closest to the mirror, giving us in that rightmost column zero one one zero. In front of the original zero one in the first two rows, we place zeros and in front of the new, the reflection, we will put ones. And this will have our gray code order so far that only one bit will change as we move from row to row. And we can repeat this process for additional columns. So now we have two columns worth of gray code, the, the middle and the right, and we had four rows worth, then we can reflect that. So now the closest to the mirror was that uh, fourth row, that one zero, and in the reflection, the fifth row is also closest to the mirror in the reflected one zero, and the farthest away was at the top, zero zero, and that is farthest away in the reflection down at the bottom, the zero zero. And again, in front of the original, uh, four rows, we add zeros, and then the final four rows, we add ones. 
And again, we are reproducing our uh, essential gray code property of when going from one row to the next, only one bit changes. So if we had a truth table in which the inputs were put in a gray code order, then we know that the important property, the defining property of gray code is that the two consecutive rows of the inputs of the truth table will differ by one and only one input, by one and one, only one bit, if you will. So then if we look at the output side of such a truth table and two consecutive rows have one, then we can be sure that there's a simplification because those consecutive rows, both containing ones, those expressions will be differ by one and only one bit. And that is what we know leads to simplification. When we previously considered simplification, we dealt with an example, which I call the trivial example. And it turned out that it was just the output. It was really just came out to be B. So here is that example written out, but in a gray coded order. So the inputs A, B, C, all the combinations are there, but they're in this gray code order where one row to the next row differs by only one bit. And what we see that the effect of the gray code ordering of the inputs leads to a sort of grouping of the ones in the outputs, the ones that lead to simplifications. And there was a lot of simplification in this example. Uh, they're, they're grouped together. So we have a large group of ones, and that will be our visual signal that there is a large simplification. We want to push this approach so that we can find as much simplification as possible. And if we look back to the gray coded rows of inputs that differ by only one and only one bit, we will we turn it around and we will say that there are rows that are different by one and only one bit that are not consecutive. So we might miss a simplification if it were to involve these two non-consecutive rows. Those ones might not be grouped together. But if we uh, push this process further and, and not just have all of our combinations represented in rows, but introduce columns and rows, this will give us even more possible ways of being next to each other and therefore more possible ways of seeing simplifications. So here in this truth table, we're pointing out that the, the row with 0, 1, 1 and the row with 1, 1, 1 differ by only that first bit, but they are not consecutive. So we would like to, to have yet another rearrangement of our truth table in which these somehow end up also next to each other. So here we introduce a version where the inputs A, B, and C occupy not just rows, but rows and columns. So A and B are going, all the combinations of A and B are going down rows in a gray code order, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, and 1, 0. But the input C is going across different columns, 0, then 1. So this is like, uh, like an Excel spreadsheet or the game Battleship, which in to specify a given input and then therefore then its output, uh, you need both a row and a column. So the one pointed out in the picture corresponds to A of 0, B of 1, and C of 0. So you've got to find the row where A is 0 and B is 1 and the column in which C is 0. And then sort of where those that row and that column intersect, that is the output corresponding to that input. And then if you note from the from the previous example that that those amber colored ones there are those ones that previously we said were uh, different by one and only one bit, but were not consecutive or not next to each other. But in this newly formed row column version of the truth table, we see that those amber colored ones are now next to each other. So we've introduced new ways to be next to each other. So new ways to find simplifications. So marrying the idea of gray code and truth tables, uh, especially looking for simplification, uh, bringing these ideas together is what's known as a Carnot map or a K map named after Maurice Carnot. Maurice Carnot was a researcher both at Bell Labs and IBM in the 50s and 60s. 
So now we're going to put together the rules that make for a Carnot map. And rule number one, the, the truth table must be put in a gray code order. Now we start doing simplifying. We look for what I'm going to call a block. And we want the blocks to be as large as possible. A block is a rectangular shape containing ones and only ones. So it can't be an L shape. It can't have a little zero in the corner. It's got to be all ones and make a rectangle. And this is a one of outputs. Uh, the ones, the simplification rules, require that these rectangles have a size of uh, that are powers of two. So one or two or four or eight. Uh, but a, a one can belong to more than one block. So if you found a block of six, that would really be two overlapping blocks of four. So the blocks, again, are rectangular, containing ones and only ones. They should be a size one, two, four, or eight. And But a, a given one can be in multiple blocks. Even our effort to split the inputs between rows and columns, there are still rows which differ by one bit that are not consecutive. Consider in the picture, the first row is w and x are 0 and 0, and the last row is w is 1 and x is 0. They differ by only the bit w, but they're not consecutive. And the same thing happens for the columns. So when looking for these blocks, you must also consider this uh, idea of wrapping, that you must sort of imagine that the first row and the last row can be considered next to each other, as well as the first column and the last column can be considered to be next to each other. So the groups might involve some wrapping. So there, in I've shown you in that example, there is a group that is surrounded by a green outline that involves the middle two rows, but the first and last column that is a group that is has this wrapping property. Here we're considering a truth table as an example of a Carnot map simplification. So we're starting off with a sort of old style traditional truth table. We have four inputs w, x, y, z, and so with four inputs there are two to the four possible combinations and we put them in a binary counting order to start so zero up to 15. And then there are the outputs for those inputs. And again, this is just a possible output, uh, nothing special here, just an example. So we can, of course, apply the old fashioned uh, sum of product approach and write a, a min term expression. So here, every expression involves all four terms, w, x, y, and z, making the min terms. And there's, there's no simplification here. And I just want you to imagine at this stage, trying to look for the simplifications in this thing to, to wonder if we have to duplicate any of these terms to look and see if any two terms differ by one and only one term. And, and you can see that it's, then it's complicated. So we want to appreciate what Carnot does for us. Here I'm showing you a mapping from the binary counting order to the gray code order. And let's just look at that 13 down there. That corresponds to W1, X1. It's in that row where W is 1 and X is 1. And then Y is 0 and Z is 0. 13 is in the, in the column where Y is 0 and Z is 1. So it was 1, 1, 0, 1, which was 13. So this is not showing you any particular outputs. It's just showing you the order when you go from the, the binary counting order to the gray code order. So let's look at that first row. It's 0, 1, 3, and then 2. So if you're going in order, it'd be the first, the second, skip over to the last one, and then come back. And the second row follows a similar pattern, 4, 5, skip to the end, and then come back and do 7. Next, we skip a row the same way we skip the column. So we go down to the last row, 8, 9, skip over to 10, and come back to 11, and then finally fill in the... Uh, the remaining empty row, which would be 12, 13, jump over to 14, come back to 15. So this is just the order of things when you're taking the binary 
ordered table to the gray code ordered table. So I've taken the example we are considering, which was originally given in the binary counting order, and applied that mapping and arrived at the following truth table. And now my job is to identify these blocks that I'm going to use to simplify. Remember our rules. A block is a rectangular set of ones. In the, so this white area is the outputs. We're looking at the outputs. We're looking for ones. They should form uh, rectangles. Uh, they must be of size one, two, four, eight, and they're allowed to overlap. And so here's what I've identified. The first column of four ones, which I've surrounded in yellow, that is a group the red square, which is the uh, middle two rows and the first two columns, uh, is, a, is a block. And then there is a final green block, which I'm using the wrapping property. So this is, again, the middle two rows, but the first and last column using the sort of wrapping property of the beginning and the end, in this case of columns. So let's take our group that we've identified one by one. So we'll start with the yellow group, which is the first column. Now I've written down the expressions for these ones, the individual ones, but, but our goal here is to not write out those expressions and to simplify them, but to, to go sort of full on just visually, let's see what's going on. So once we have identified a block that we're considering and the block is of outputs, then we go back and consider which inputs led to that block. So this, this block is the first column and all of the rows. And then we ask uh, for our block, which inputs are changing and which inputs are not changing. And the inputs that are changing, we're going to uh, eliminate from our expression and those that are not changing, we're going to keep for our expression. So in this column of four ones, the input W changes. So in the first and second row, it was a zero. In the third and fourth row, it was a one. Therefore, the input W changed for this block. And so uh, there is no W in the expression for this block. Same thing for X. X went from zero to one and then to one to zero. So X changed and so we throw away the things that change. The Y remains a zero for this column. There was only one column, so Y doesn't have the opportunity to change. So Y is zero and similarly Z is zero. So the expression for this group, we keep the inputs that did not change, y and z, and they were both zero, so it will be prime. So the expression for this group will be y prime z prime. So next we'll consider the red group, which is the middle rows, the middle two rows in the first two columns. And after we've identified the block of ones, which are outputs, then we turn our attention back to the inputs. So in the middle two rows, we look to see what the input W is for the middle two rows, and we see then it changes from zero to one. So it is changing, so we will throw out the W. The X for the middle two rows is always one, so we're going to keep the X. Now we look at the columns, the first two columns. So Y is a zero in the first two columns. It does not change, so we're going to keep it. But for the first two columns, the input Z changes from zero to one. So we're going to throw it away. So we're going to throw away the W because it changed and the Z because it changed, but we're going to keep the X, which was a one and the Y, which was a zero, leaving our expression X, Y prime. Now, if you look at all the letters, this is what we're trying to avoid doing. But if you do look at all the letters in there, you'll see that they all have X, Y prime and then and then all the other letters have all the possible combinations. That's why they simplify out and the x, y prime remains. So we're looking for a visual way to not do the algebra, but just to be led to that conclusion. Our green block is the middle two rows and the first and last column. We're using the wrapping property. Again, once we've identified the block in the 
outputs, then we focus our attention back to the inputs that create that block, that overlap to make that block. And so again, it's the middle two rows in the first and last column. The input W changes in the middle two rows. It goes from zero to one, we're throwing it away. The X from the middle two columns remains a one, so we're keeping it. The now going across the columns, the first and last column, the Y was a zero and then was a, in the first column and a one in the last column, so it changed and we're throwing it away. The Z was a zero in both the first and last columns, so we're keeping it. So W changed and Y changed, so we throw them away. The X remained the same as a one and the Z remained the same as a zero, so our expression for this is XZ prime. All the ones in the output have to be accounted for, even if they're in a group all by themselves. And then once we've accounted for all of the groups, uh, then we have an expression, the uh, final expression. If the block is of size two, we will eliminate one of the Boolean variables from the expression. If a block was of size four, which was the case here, we el eliminate two Boolean variables and so on. Again, after you identify the block, then you look back to the inputs that create that block and keep the inputs that don't change and add them together. We're throwing away any inputs that do change. And then once we have all the expressions for all the blocks, then we can OR them together. And if we've seen the blocks and made the blocks as big as they can possibly be, then this should be the full-blown simplification. Here I'm just using a nice color coding to show you the mapping from the binary coded uh, outputs to the gray coded outputs. And here's the mapping from the binary order to the gray code order for the four input table and just using colors instead of the counting that we played with earlier. Now this whole Carnot map thing looks confusing at first, but you have to uh, compare it to the simplification algebra that you would have to do otherwise, and then you will begin to appreciate the sort of simple visualization that Carnot provided.